Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the latest in our round of FCC Zoom events. My name is Rebecca Bailey. I am a correspondent member governor of the FCC and I work for AFP. I will be your moderator tonight. We're talking about Sri Lanka. It's in its deepest economic crisis since independence. It's defaulted on its debt for the first time in its history and the country is running out of food, fuel and medicine. The economic collapse has birthed political upheaval. For months now, we've had protesters outside the president's office demanding his resignation. You've had frequent clashes between police and protesters and riots uh, one night killed at least nine people. So the situation is really dire. We now have an all party government in place, but even the new prime minister has said the next few months are gonna be the hardest in Sri Lanka's life. So how will Sri Lanka navigate this new period? How did it get to this point in the first place? And what will the knock-on effects be, not just for the region, but for the world? Uh, I can't answer any of those questions for you, but I have two very excellent guests who will, who will be able to shed some light on them. Um, first, my colleague, Amal Jayasinghe. He heads AFP operations in Sri Lanka and the Maldives. He has decades of experience reporting from Sri Lanka and the wider region many world scoops, including being the first to report the December 2004 Asian tsunami. His reporting on Sri Lanka's drawn out Tamil Sepharist conflict earned him a medal and title, Knight of the National Order of Higher Merit from France's government in 2005. And he himself is a past, uh, past president of the Sri Lankan Foreign Correspondents Club and one of their very few life honorary members. He's joined by Dr. Dishni Murakun, the executive director of the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka and head of its macroeconomic policy research. She has extensive experience working in policy development committees of, in, of Sri Lanka's government. She's also worked as a consultant to international development organizations, as well as serving on the boards of several corporate and academic entities in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much for joining me, both of you. Before we begin, I'd like to remind our audience, please, please send your questions. We don't, you know, it's very, it's, it's rare that you have a chance to put them to such eminent uh, experts, and we have them for a whole hour. So if you do have questions, please send them to question at fcchk.org. That's question, singular, at fcchk.org. And I will endeavor to put them to our guests. So I'd like to start with you. Amal, if that's all right. Um, you're reporting every day there. I, I'm seeing your copy come into the newsroom. Can you just give us, um, can you give us a sense of what the situation is like at the moment? Where are we now in this, uh, at this moment in time? Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, thanks very much to, to the Hong Kong FCC for having me. The, uh, basically, the uh, situation for the ordinary people is that uh, you have to put up with all kinds of uh, hardships. Uh, for example, to get your fuel, uh, petrol or diesel, uh, is, a, is a bit of a challenge. And uh, the day-to-day -day things like uh, finding uh, cooking gas is a problem. Food is in short supply. Some of the uh, essentials like uh, dal and sugar, they have been rationed. The, uh, it's, it's available. The prices are very high. The uh, inflation in uh, Colombo right now is uh, at something like... Uh, uh, it, it's... Uh, a little over 50% if you look at food inflation. And the uh, Colombo crisis, I think we, we had the figures yesterday, uh, it's uh, touching 40% now. That's the official uh, figures. Then on top of that, you have daily power cuts. At one point, we had uh, power cuts lasting about 13 and a half hours, the longest power cuts we've had. Now it's sort of somewhat uh, reduced. The, uh, there are power cuts lasting three, four hours. Generally, on a day-to-day on -day basis, people find it uh, very difficult to manage uh, because the essentials are not easily available. But some people spend days sometimes uh, waiting in a queue uh, to, get, uh, to top up their tanks. So transport is a problem. So the, uh, uh, even for children to get to school, uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. So all around, people are going through an extremely difficult period. So a lot of people are saying that it's something it's uh, it reminds you of uh, what people went through in the early 70s when we had a socialist government and things were rationed and there was a ban on imports. So it's somewhat similar. A lot of people are comparing the current situation to what we had in the 70s. Uh, but there are others who say that uh, the current situation, current crisis, uh, 
is probably far worse than that. And uh, Dishni, what's your take on where we are right now? Um, yes, I mean, I agree with uh, what Amar said. It, it's, um, I mean, there is a whole, there is an entire generation of Sri Lankans who have not seen Q. So I think a uh, sense of, you know, how did we get to this point? Uh, uh, is it something that, you know, so many people ask uh, us because the problem started as an economic crisis uh, and then spilled over into a political uh, and, and a, a social crisis and then and I think that's the, the, the real sort of challenge um, before us now, because it's very difficult to start putting things right on the economic front until you have a, a degree of political stability and, and some sense of um, you know, political legitimacy of, of the government um, when they're trying to do um, reforms, et cetera. So yes, I mean, it, it's sort of uh, unprecedented uh, level of hardship that uh, uh, people are facing uh, today, uh, as, as Amal said, queues and, and shortages of uh, certain basics. Um, and unfortunately, I think, you know, uh, things will get a little tougher in, in, in the coming months uh, before uh, we start to see, ease, see uh, easing of, of the current uh, constraints. Hmm. And as, as, as kind of both of you being obviously long time Sri Lanka watchers living there, like what's shocked you most about this crisis? Or, or conversely, have you not been shocked? Is this, you know, did you see this coming? Uh, maybe Amal, if you can uh, go first. Sure, sure. And the, what is shocking is that the uh, people are putting up with quite a lot. I mean, I expected people to get on the streets and protest. We, we do have uh, protests almost on a daily basis. And in fact, there is an ongoing protest, as you mentioned in your introduction, outside the president's office. But the uh, considering how difficult it is to get your basic needs, the uh, we are not seeing a kind of uh, reaction from the public. We're not seeing a violent reaction from the public. Things like uh, not being able to get your basic medicines. Now, the, uh, we can talk, I mean, we can deal with the fuel shortages, electricity and all that. But today we are in a situation where some of the hospitals have stopped their routine surgeries because they don't have anesthetic drugs. Hospitals are appealing uh, for medicines. The uh, poor people don't get the uh, medicine that have been prescribed by doctors. The hospitals have run out of uh, supplies, not just the medicines, but even medical devices and stuff like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, tragic situation when you look at the health sector. Now, what is shocking is that people are putting up with a lot. So I, I would have thought that uh, if, if this situation existed in, for example, let's say in neighboring India, people would have got on the streets and there would have been riots. Now, we, we, know, that, uh, we know that in the places like India, when uh, uh, onion prices go up, people riot. The Colombo prices have more than doubled it for many of the things, but there is some kind of acceptance. I think the, I don't know whether people are sort of uh, putting up with a lot. I don't know whether it's sort of being bottled up now and you know waiting to it up at some point or the other. So for me, that's, that's a bit uh, surprising. The, uh, how people are sort of putting up with these difficulties. You know, you, you have occasionally uh, some people waiting in a gas uh, or a queue for uh, cooking gas. Uh, very often uh, you, you hear people fighting with each other and that's not so much for uh, the lack of gas, but you know, somebody trying to jump the queue or something like that. And even in petrol queues, you have uh, some policemen try to uh, jump the queue and people would uh, react. But uh, apart from that, the uh, that's a bit, uh, a bit surprising. I, I think uh, Sri Lankan people are, are putting up with a lot. Mm. And Dishni, uh, what, what has shocked you or not? Well, I, I think what really um, shocks me is that we um, got ourselves into this position because, uh, I mean, Sri Lanka is a country that uh, is rather familiar with the uh, ups and downs uh, of, you know, uh, the economy being hit regularly by all kinds of shocks. I mean, we had a 30-year conflict uh, 
uh, we had the tsunami uh, in even in 2019 when uh, after the you know a decade of peace there was again a, a unexpected um, um, bombing in the in the city so you know i think i think we are used to um, the ups and downs and 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 some sense uh, of uh, competent management that has uh, and a bit of luck sometimes that has allowed us to uh, in in some sense ride those crises um, without uh, you know coming to a position uh, where we have to actually default uh, on our debt um, so given the history of you know um, the resilience uh, of the sri lankan economy over the years um, the you know uh, covid related uh, impacts on the economy things were getting worse it, it wasn't that policymakers uh, were not aware or inexperienced to you know be able to deal with um, uh, the downturn at the appropriate time um, how everything was allowed to slide i think to a uh, to a point when you know the entire cabinet um, and and the top economic uh, management team had to uh, uh, resign is something that is is a bit you know um, uh, that I think that's the aspect that I still can't quite fathom. Uh, how is it that we got ourselves into this position? Because this is a problem that you know uh, we knew was uh, brewing. It's not something that. You know, it has overnight. We had two years of COVID, and and through that period, we knew that things were getting um, rather uh, tight, and, and and we need to have Plan A, B, and C. But it seemed that we only had Plan A, uh, and and uh, no sort of you know backup uh, strategic thinking um, to not default on on debt and and come to this kind of a crisis situation where we are. Uh, short of uh, dollars as we've never been before. Well, <laughs> uh, you said you uh, couldn't fathom how you'd got to this point, uh, the country got to this point, but actually that was sort of my next question. Um, for people who haven't been following the economic crisis particularly closely until now, could you just explain to us how, how Sri Lanka did end up in this, like the economic mechanisms, uh, the economic events by which Sri Lanka arrived at this point? Uh, Dishne, please. <laughs> yes, uh, um, I'll try and keep it as uh, simple as I can. I mean, essentially what we did over the last decade after the um, war ended was that we went out to international capital markets uh, and, and started to issue sovereign bonds uh, on, on quite a, a large scale. And Sri Lanka was not an exception. I mean, there were a lot of emerging markets that did it. Uh, and of course, we uh, also borrowed from uh, bilateral lenders like China. Now, you know, Foreign borrowing um, of, on that scale means that we have to either use that um, those funds very efficiently and effectively so that we are able to uh, service our debt, um, or we have to try and ensure that our foreign exchange earnings are sort of keeping up with the amounts of foreign borrowings that we did. Now, we didn't do either of those things. Um, what the uh, successive governments by and large did was to rely on trying to refinance. Um, so each time a bond came up for settlement, we'd borrow, roll over that uh, bond and, and, and uh, settle the debt. So here you have a major shock in, in, in the form of COVID um, where governments have to start spending to, you know, for all kinds of reasons. And, and that means you're macro fundamentals take a bit of a hit, your sovereign credit ratings go down, and suddenly you find that you're frozen out of um, uh, capital markets. So essentially, that's what happened. Um, we borrowed in excess of about, uh, you know, for every year after having paid the debt, um, 2.5 2 billion in excess to, you know, build up reserves and all of that. We didn't have access to that. So the Policy options for the government um, was when the early sort of you know signs were there that we are coming into a foreign um, exchange crisis is to try and um, start you know keep the door open um, with the IMF, uh, look at 
whether debt restructuring is, is, is necessary, put some of the macro um, fiscal monetary policies that they had um, used as emergency tools uh, during COVID-19 back on, on the right track. For instance, uh, we had given huge tax cuts at the end of 2019 when the government changed. Now, beyond a certain point, I think there was sufficient room for the government to reverse that uh, decision because the fiscal position was so weak. Uh, and similarly on the uh, monetary policy front, you know, you can't keep printing money. Um, you have to start looking at um, other ways of financing your um, spending. So it, it was a you know, series of policy missteps, even when the uh, reserves um, were declining sharply, um, they decided they were going to fix the exchange rate. Uh, and, and, and peg it to the dollar and, and just maintain that. If you don't have reserves, how do you do it? Um, so suddenly when, you know, it was very obvious that we didn't have the dollars and this exchange rate um, had led to all kinds of secondary parallel markets uh, emerging, um, it was floated. So the exchange rate floated, uh, depreciated by about 80%. So all of these things, you know, are adding to um, what Amal mentioned earlier, cost of living pressures, um, inflation is sort of skyrocketing because of um, the dollar depreciation, because of the money printing. Um, and of course, you know, to some extent, uh, commodity price increases uh, globally. But um, the bulk of the, um, the problems really um, were created by us um, through uh, mismanagement on the macro front. I actually have a question uh, quite early on from an audience member. Thank you. Um, Joshua Zimmerman asks, the major global investment banks advise the Central Bank of Sri Lanka on the issuance of billions of dollars of US dollar denominated sovereign bonds, with the caveat that hindsight is 20 out of 20, and given the current crisis, did all that debt issuance hurt or help? Um, Dishni, I, I guess uh, maybe you could take that one quickly as well. Well, I mean, that's interesting, uh, a question. I, I, if we, we issued that debt under two IMF programs. We had an IMF program in 2010 to 12 and, and 2016 to 2019. So, you know, even with IMF um, uh, sort of oversight, um, there was a time when global um, interest rates were much lower and, and it was therefore cheaper for us to borrow from overseas than uh, borrow from um, local markets. Now, the question again is how did we spend it? And, and quite frankly, there is no accounting for how we've spent that money because that's the trick with these kinds of borrowings. Um, you governments don't have to um, answer difficult questions that multilateral lenders like the World Bank or ADB might ask uh, before they lend big amounts to you. Here, you can simply um, issue a bond and there's enough appetite or was, uh, there was enough appetite out there for emerging market uh, sovereign uh, bonds. Um, so it, a lot of it went for current consumption um, because uh, to some extent, at least the loans that we took from China, you can see um, the outcomes in terms of some infrastructure projects and, and you know, physical sort of assets that have been generated as a result. But uh, monies from sovereign bonds, um, I, I, you know, it's, it's very difficult to uh, be accountable. Um, and, and this is a, not unique to Sri Lanka. This is a problem that's there in African countries, uh, some Latin America, American countries as well that have gone into these kinds of borrowings. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to send in a question, it's question singular at fcchk.org. Um, I actually asked uh, one of our other colleagues if he had any questions, and uh, he uh, asked, uh, why has Sri Lanka suffered import crunches like this so many times since independence? You, um, Sri Lanka has been under an IMF instrument something like a dozen times. They've had past periods of good goods rationing because of an inability to pay for imports. So what is it about Sri Lanka's economy and political system that leads to this seemingly structural issue with the economy? 
Well, uh, Rebecca, the, of course, I, I must stress that I'm not an economist, but uh, you know, covering the Sri Lanka story for now 40 years, the, uh, what I see is that, Dushni, uh, you just mentioned earlier, we had the, uh, I think they, there were some very serious blunders uh, on, the, uh, on the fiscal side, as well as on the monetary side. So as she quite, uh, I mean, quite rightly pointed out, you try to uh, pick the currency, you try to you try to maintain an exchange rate, you try to defend the rupee. And now we are told the government spent something like a little over $5 billion to defend the currency at a particular level. So the, you were just uh, bleeding uh, Forex uh, simply because you wanted to keep uh, the, the rupee, uh, the dollar at uh, 200 rupees, uh, something, something thereabouts. So the, that was a big mistake. And as uh, Dushni uh, mentioned about the, on the fiscal side, the government drastically reduced taxes. And uh, what they did was now take, reducing things like VAT. These were the guaranteed regular streams of revenue for the government. So those were reduced by almost half overnight. Now, the, 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 as a result, the government lost something like 600 to $800 billion based on the latest information that we've got uh, at today's exchange rate, that's about $2.2 billion. So the government overnight lost that cash. So it's, it's purely a, a problem of management. And I think the uh, a lot of it is uh, on the fiscal side, but quite a lot of it uh, is the doing of the central bank. So what Sri Lanka is facing today is essentially a man-made disaster. And the, uh, as far as disasters go, this is probably the worst disaster this country has faced since independence. So it's, uh, I mean, we've gone through tsunamis, we've gone through 30 years of war. Even at the height of the war, we didn't have a situation where we had to control, where, where we had to uh, ration food, where we had to say, okay, you cannot import things. Now, of course, another interesting thing is that the minute the government tries to restrict imports, of course, from about early 2020, they've restricted uh, all kinds of imports, including vehicles. Of course, vehicles are not coming into the country, but imports have not slowed. In fact, we are told that last year, the imports had actually increased. So uh, if the people are not allowed to import things that they want, things they can sell, they'll find another way to do it. I mean, one good example is, although the government banned the import of cars and you know, uh, cars, motorcycles, three wheelers, the things which people usually use. Uh, they, they even uh, ban trucks, but they allowed the tractors to be imported because they said, oh, for agriculture, you need tractors. So today you have uh, a disproportionate number of tractors imported into the country. Now, if the country uses, if people, people purchase, let's say uh, a few hundred tractors, now we've got thousands of tractors which have come into the country. There are no takers, but people have imported, fearing that at some point they will ban the import of tractors. So better have a you know large fleet of tractors to make a quick buck. And at one point I was thinking it's not a bad idea to buy a tractor to uh, for your daily commute because uh, that's the only vehicle now which doesn't attract any uh, taxes because agricultural vehicles are tax free and that's the only thing you can bring in, bring into the country. So this kind of thing has really uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, entire system is topsy-turvy uh, because of this. So the uh, import restrictions, all this, you can really lay it at the door of uh, the, the, the policy makers or government. And uh, I wouldn't really blame only the uh, politicians here. I think the central bank played a very big role uh, in bringing Sri Lanka to this uh, situation today. Hmm. And um, you said it was a man-made disaster. So let's uh, let's move over to the politics. Let's talk about the men uh, behind this, and that, you know, the particularly the powerful Rajapaksa family. Um, can you just explain again for those who maybe are coming to this slightly new? Like, can you just give us an overview of who the Rajapaksas are and explain their sort of significance in Sri Lankan politics? Sure, sure. I mean, the uh, Rajapaksa family, they've been in politics for decades. Uh, it's the, uh, the president's father had been a member of parliament and the, uh, the president's uh, elder brother, who's, who, who became the president in 2005, uh, he was prime minister very briefly from about 2004. And uh, after he became president, uh, 
uh, his brothers joined the government. So you had uh, his uh, youngest brother, Basil, coming into uh, the government. And uh, the uh, current president was a very top civil uh, public servant. He was a secretary to the Ministry of Defense. And uh, some, uh, some would say that uh, he was probably more powerful than uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa during Mahindra's uh, presidency between 2005 and uh, 2015. So the, uh, at, at one point, we had uh, uh, four Raj members of the Rajapaksa family in the cabinet. In fact, the, at the beginning of the year, you had the president who was the head of cabinet and the minister of defense. You had the prime minister who is Mahindra Rajapaksa. Then you had uh, Chamal Rajapaksa, who is the eldest in the eldest brother in the family. And you had another brother, Basil, who is uh, thought to be the political brains of the family. Uh, he, he was uh, finance minister. And then you had a nephew, uh, who Nama Rajapaksa, that is uh, President Mahinda Rajapaksa's son, uh, who, is, uh, who was the minister of sports. So we had five Rajapaksas in the cabinet, four brothers and one nephew. Uh, with, with the political, with the, with the economic crisis and, and, and the protests, uh, this protest campaign called uh, Gota Go Home, the, uh, the president tried to make some uh, adjustments. He tried to get some other family members out of cabinet. So initially you have, we had uh, Namal and uh, the eldest brother out of the cabinet, and then subsequently the finance minister too. And uh, it was down to two brothers, two Rajapaksa brothers in the cabinet till the 9th of May. And, and the 9th of May, uh, we, we had a situation where there were, there, were sort of, there were riots and nine people were killed in those riots. So uh, with that unrest, uh, Prime Minister Rajapaksa quit and cleared the way for the new government. So Rajapaksas are very, very important and they've, they've controlled Sri Lankan politics, they've dominated Sri Lankan politics uh, uh, from about 2005. So uh, it, it's... Um, you would say that uh, they play a very important role in, uh, in, in Sri Lankan politics today. They have a tremendous amount of influence. They have a lot of support uh, from the similar Buddhist majority in the country. The, uh, even though uh, uh, today there are protests against them because of the economic uh, situation, uh, I still think that uh, they, they, they command uh, a considerable amount of support. It may not be as big as what it was in 2019, but I think uh, still a considerable amount of the Sri Lankan electorate uh, would, uh, would still support them. And certainly uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa, as, as the man who uh, ended the war in 2009, uh, has earned a lot of respect from the, uh, especially the Sinhala Buddhist uh, community. So uh, I, I think uh, we're not in a position to write off the Rajapaksas uh, from Sri Lankan politics. So it's certainly not the case. And that was going to be my last uh, next question because I've seen like lots of you know oh the fall of the Rajapaksas like this. I mean, Mahinda's resignation was that capitulation or do you think it's a more long term strategy? Rebecca, I think the uh, there are there are people who would say that uh, yes, you know they they've taken a step back, uh, you know the uh, to sort of uh, uh, to to fight another day. And uh, in, in Sri Lankan politics, people have a way of bouncing back. I mean, if you take the current prime minister, a lot of people had written him off. Uh, he actually lost the uh, uh, elections in uh, 2020. Uh, his party managed to get just one seat. And yet, uh, today he has become the prime minister. So in Sri Lankan politics, you never know. And it, it, it would be a, a big mistake to write off anybody. Mm. And um, I have a, another question from our uh, audience, uh, from Kuo uh, Gigiga says, um, she says, how do the Sri Lankan people view the current government? So I think she means the all party government that's now in place with the new prime minister, as you mentioned, is there a sense of whether they have support? Well, if you want me to have a go at it, I certainly do. The, um... <laughs> The, uh, the general feeling is that uh, you should uh, give them some time. I think uh, a lot of the middle classes and even the business community uh, seem to think that uh, the current prime minister will be able to deliver. Uh, but the question is whether this is really 
uh, an all party government because the if you really look at it the president's party has still not joined the cabinet uh, they from what we hear have actually refused to uh, be a party to this cabinet they were offered cabinet posts but they have not taken it up yet then the uh, then there is a question of legitimacy of the prime minister although a lot of people feel that uh, you know with his ex with his experience and his connections with uh, people outside he may be able to uh, you know uh, uh, turn around the economy and maybe uh, uh, improve the situation there a lot of lot of uh, a lot of expectation on that front but uh, what about his legitimacy he, he just he he has only one seat uh, in a 225 member parliament i mean uh, if he goes to the loo while the parliament is in session his party is not represented in in the house <laughs> so I mean, you know, it's it's a very precarious situation for him, and so he needs the support of uh, the, the the government, which in in the eyes of the public is discredited. So without the uh, president's uh, party supporting him, he will not be able to function. So the uh, you are, we are already seeing a lot of some tension between the prime minister and and the president's party, uh, or whether it, it, it's it's. Right now, it's to do with constitutional reforms. Because the prime minister seems to think that you can't address the economic issues unless you uh, reform the, uh, the the political setup. Uh, you you rewrite the constitution, and he he feels that the presidential powers should be reduced, and we should go back to a Westminster kind of uh, parliamentary system, which we had bef uh, before 1978. So, so there there is that debate going on whether we should. Uh, reduce the powers of the president or whether we should uh, totally abolish the presidency and go back to a system of you know like 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 system in britain so these debates are going on and uh, legitimacy or th those questions are also there so the uh, the question is um, uh, do people feel that the, the new government will deliver i think yes there's a lot of expectation but uh, realistically speaking the lot of people are, are still sort of keeping their fingers crossed mm. And Vishnu, what do we know about the, the economic cred uh, credentials of those who are currently in power? Like, uh, you know, as Amal said, like, even if there is this idea that you have to solve a kind of constitutional question before you start fixing the economy, what, what, what clues do we have about what actions they might take to try and resolve the economic crisis? Well, the uh, new prime minister, I mean, he, he's, he's been uh, prime minister on, uh, in, in, I think, two previous occasions as well. Um, he has always been very pro-market uh, and, and reform-minded. And, um, you know, even what he's been saying recently, um, you know, the, the gist of uh, what he, is well, quite clear that, you know, the previous government had a, sort of a tendency to look inward. Um, you know, even some of the import um, uh, uh, controls that they brought in, that was in part to deal with the, uh, the foreign exchange crisis. But, you know, it was also tied into their sort of um, ideological thinking that we need to uh, focus on, on raising national, uh, you know, production, import substitution, etc. cetera. Um, the prime minister is, uh, uh, pretty much on, on a different page altogether when it comes to um, his economic uh, uh, policy. He's, he's uh, very much um, a person who's always pushed for um, regulatory reforms, you know, to cut back on state involvement uh, in, in economic uh, activity. Uh, and I think has a fairly sound grasp of, you know, the measures that Sri Lanka needs right now to, um, bring about macro stability. And I think that is the priority. Um, uh, much of it that will come with the IMF program. And, and I think he's, he's, he's quite uh, um, comfortable with um, uh, dealing with IMF uh, conditionalities, et cetera, privatization, all of these things. Now, the, the question is, um, you know, even for reform-minded um, politicians, they struggle to push reforms through. And, and, and this prime minister in his previous uh, role in 2015 to 2019 uh, struggled because there is a resistance in, in, in to sort of, uh, you know, any uh, notions of privatizations or doing away with labor 
uh, uh, laws that you know give um, uh, security to workers, etc. Um, in the best of times, those reforms are difficult. Now we are here midterm electoral mid electoral cycle, uh, a government that has lost its popularity. So, and 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 painful reforms are ahead of us. I mean, already the prime minister has um, spelled out tax increases that will kick in from October. So, you know, cost of living is already so high, then tax increases will again hit um, the ordinary man and woman. So to what extent will the government be able to um, see these reforms through, um, that's, that's sort of a, you know, a difficult um, question. But I think right now there is a sense of uh, anticipation that things will get better because you know, we've had queues, but we are now seeing um, shipments of fuel coming in. We've seen power cuts that are mm -hmm. being reduced. But that's not to say that next month and the month after or the month after, um, it, it's going to be, your purse is going to get hit, essentially. Um, then will the government in this kind of strange arrangement, will they be able to um, hold together and see this um, economic reforms through until the next uh, elections are called? Um, next year or year after. So, you know, in, in the immediate next few months, I, I agree with what um, Amal said, there is a sense of let's give them a chance, you know, we've, we've seen some improvements, but um, the food uh, security issue, and then that's not peculiar to Sri Lanka, this is now a global issue. The prices are expected to really skyrocket. Um, so, and, and Sri Lanka is a net food uh, importer. So how do we, um, how does the government without much popularity, um, will they be able to sort of take the people along with them um, through these difficult reforms? That's the question. Um, I have a question um, again from uh, Gua Gigi Gua. Uh, she's, she says, uh, do, do you view the debt restructuring from the IMF as a positive thing for the country. We know accepting the terms of a debt restructuring means savings for the country, cutting welfare for broader society. I mean, and maybe I could ask you, uh, Dushni, what you think. And I mean, um, Amal, I don't know if uh, when you've been reporting, if you have a sense what the public think about uh, the IMF restructuring. Uh, maybe uh, Dushni, if you could just answer first, please. Well, to me, I mean, as an economist, uh, debt default is the least popular measure. I mean, I would have argued against it. Um, debt restructure is fine because if, if it comes to a point we have to restructure, uh, you know, uh, but a default puts you in a different, you know, uh, club of a handful of countries that have default and Sri Lanka's reputational risks. Um, uh, I think it's, it's taken a hit. Now, and, and it's, it's something that we could have avoided, that, that, that sort of um, the unpalatable uh, truth there. Now, a debt restructuring um, is, it hinges on two things. First is that we have to get a um, staff level agreement with the IMF and then simultaneously negotiate with the creditors. And once there is some agreement that will then go to the um, executive board of the IMF and they sign off and that's when the full IMF program is in place. Now, question is um, whether the debt restructuring talks it will be something that we can conclude quickly or is this something that's going to drag on uh, because it's not a very straightforward uh, process anymore. We have complex set of creditors, we have bondholders who are you know, dispersed, uh, but mostly let's say US bondholders. And then we have China. Now in a debt restructuring, uh, creditors ask for uh, comparable treatment. If you look at Zambia, for instance, you'll see that their debt restructuring uh, 
dragged on for, I think, almost two years. Um, China and the bondholders, you know, they couldn't come to any agreement. Now, Sri Lanka has got the same um, advisors that dealt with uh, Zambia. So they have pre sort of, you know, they've already got experience. Um, and, and I think the hope is that um, they will be able to, you know, the learning curve is there. Um, China has also perhaps gone through some of these um, negotiations with their other creditors, and now they have a different uh, uh, approach to the whole uh, exercise. Um, best optimistic uh, expectation is that if we can tie all of the negotiations up in six months, then we've done well. I will go back to China in a second, um, but um, uh, Amala, do you do you, what? Do you have a sense from the public about what they think about the uh, IMF talks? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, for me, what, uh, another another interesting thing about the IMF is uh, when it comes to Sri Lankan public opinion, there seems to have been a seismic shift. Two years ago, politicians would campaign on the basis that they will have nothing to do with the IMF, they will have nothing to do with the World Bank. And in fact, one of the popular slogans was, unplug the IMF, you know, unplug Sri Lanka from the IMF. That, that was a very catchy slogan uh, two to three years ago. But today you see in the um, vernacular press, the Singhala press and the Tamil press, the, uh, in the editorials, in, in, you know, people, uh, people writing to the newspapers and local politicians making speeches all over the place, basically asking the government to go to the IMF. So it's a complete, uh, complete sort of shift in uh, public uh, perception and uh, public uh, view of these uh, international lending institutions. Now it has come to a stage where people are blaming the government for not going to the IMF earlier. And in fact, the president himself has said this was one of his mistakes. One of the mistakes he did was not having, uh, not going to the IMF earlier. I mean, he, he said about his uh, agricultural policy also, he said that was a disaster. And the next thing is, he said, uh, Sri Lanka should have gone to the IMF much earlier. So we are seeing a, a, a huge shift in public opinion when it comes to international uh, organizations. And what do they do? I mean, the, uh, essentially, the, they, are, they are asking the government to do away with the subsidies and basically uh, ensure that there is uh, sufficient government revenue. Uh, I mean, have realistic tariffs for electricity and these utilities and stuff like that. So I think today going to the IMF and, and having an IMF program is probably, it's a lot easier today than it would have been a few years ago because there is this acceptance that uh, if you go to the IMF, yes, there will have to be a lot of belt tightening and then it's inevitable. So I think to, to a great extent, people have come to realize uh, that obviously they'll have to, there will be a, there'll be a price to pay and that is by way of higher prices, uh, higher taxes, and the government seems to be doing those things already. I mean, they have uh, basically done away with the, diesel subsidy now the diesel the diesel price is basically they're recovering almost the, the cost so the next step would be electricity and we are told that there's going to be another steep increase in electricity tariffs uh, taxes are being increased so everything that the ima would have asked them to do they have already done so this is more or less like prior action by the government before going in for a program so i think the the uh, the crisis to some extent has helped the government to go for, to take these very difficult decisions because there is greater acceptance of those things uh, compared to a few years ago. Thank you. Um, so, Dishni, you mentioned China. Um, I want to talk about China because obviously there's there's been a lot of press and like you know they're accused of debt tra trap diplomacy and Sri Lanka has been used as an example of that. So, um, could you just give us a sort of overview of? of China's involvement in Sri Lanka and, and why it's so important? Um, yes, I mean, you know, Ch um, China-Sri Lanka relations, I mean, these go back centuries, but uh, the, the break, I think, um, came somewhere around 2006, 2007, when um, Mahindra Rajapaksa was president. We were in the midst of a, a three-year uh, intense uh, uh, military sort of effort to crush the um, LTTE, 
um, when a lot of the Western governments uh, and even India sort of, you know, took a step back, um, China was the one country that offered uh, financial assistance, military uh, assistance, all of the rest of it. And, and from the time that the uh, war ended in 2010, you can see Chinese sort of um, influence on political and economic uh, front was quite um, significant. And, you know, the change of government in 2015, they, they thought, no, we are going to move away from China. We're going to uh, close off some of those projects. But ultimately, uh, that government also did a U-turn because uh, even though they had more of a pro-West uh, uh, foreign policy, um, you know, they, they didn't have uh, funds. They didn't get much economic assistance. So, um, to the extent that China had deep pockets, they've, they've been able to um, play a, a major role. Now, the debt trap narrative, I mean, we've looked at the numbers, we've written on it. Uh, this is somewhat of a misrepresentation in, in, the, in the Sri Lankan context. If you look at, uh, let's say before COVID-19 hit, um, China's uh, share of Sri Lanka's total foreign debt was about 10%. Share of international sovereign bonds was about 37 or 38 percent. So our problem really is that, you know, it was the capital market borrowing rather than the loans that we took from um, China. But of course, um, the loans we took from China, I said that you know there have been some outcomes in terms of infrastructure projects, etc. There have been um, some positive uh, infrastructure projects through Chinese development assistance, but there have also been some very questionable ones, which uh, I think, uh, you know, were more to do uh, to please the political, um, Sri Lankan political leadership rather than investment decisions that were based on uh, any kinds of economic or, you know, uh, social cost benefit analysis. So it's a mixed bag of investments, but the the narrative that you know the debt crisis that uh, Sri Lanka is uh, finding itself is, is somehow directly related to us being, uh, borrowing from China. No, um, to me that doesn't uh, you know it's not much uh, evidence to support that. Hmm. And I am all like, do you think that the the crisis and and the fact that you are going to go to the IMF now? Do you think that will change anything in terms of Sri Lanka's diplomatic orientation? Uh, does it move it sort of away from China towards India? Is, is that just, again, is that a narrative much like the debt trap one that might have been overblown a bit? Um, how do you see the sort of fallout diplomatically happening? Well, actually, Rebecca, if you look at the uh, Sri Lanka's decision to go to the IMF, the central bank, the former governor of the central bank was very much against it. The secretary to the Ministry of Finance was also against it. And now we are told that the uh, Chinese were not very happy that Sri Lanka was going to the IMF. So it, Sri Lankan government is on record, at least the former finance minister was on record saying China did not like the idea of Sri Lanka going to the IMF and also restructuring debt. The, uh, the Sri Lankan government had repeatedly asked the Chinese uh, for some kind of debt moratorium uh, to restructure the Chinese debt. So all the Chinese did was, they didn't respond to any of these uh, publicly made requests, but they said they are willing to give more loans to repay the existing Chinese loans. So that was the line that China took. And uh, the former finance minister, uh, he said he had a meeting with the Chinese ambassador in Colombo to explain to him why Sri Lanka had to go to the IMF and he claimed that the Chinese accepted Colombo's position and agreed to support Sri Lanka at the IMF because China is also a member of the IMF and IMF is going to support uh, somehow the Sri Lanka's request for emergency uh, fu funding, that kind of thing. So, but with Sri Lanka going to the IMF, we know that uh, the Indians had been putting a lot of pressure on the Sri Lankan government to seek an IMF loan. In fact, when the Indians gave a currency swap, one of the conditions in that currency swap that it could be rolled over, I think maybe it could, it could be rolled over twice, but if you want to roll over it uh, three times, 
then it was subject to Sri Lanka actually going for an IMF program. So, so you could see the, the regional, uh, the, the power play here. India, New Delhi, was trying to get Sri Lanka to go for an IMF program, whereas Beijing was resisting that. So we are seeing a lot of that uh, geopolitical stuff uh, coming into play uh, over the Sri Lankan economic crisis. So the IMF, yes, they will. They, they are now in talks with IMF. So obviously, uh, sooner or later, there might there is likely to be an IMF program. And uh, obviously, the Chinese are not very happy with this debt restructuring thing at all. And recently, we had the governor of the central bank saying that all creditors would be treated equally. And that's not something that has gone down well with China. Because the uh, what happens in Sri Lanka, there can be, this can, uh, can be a, a kind of an example for others in Africa or even in Asia itself. So the, uh, if Sri Lanka is able to pull this off and uh, the Chinese have to get a, a serious haircut after you know, pumping a lot of money here, uh, this is not a precedent that uh, China would like to set. I think the, the Chinese must be quite worried uh, the way things are going. And we are actually seeing uh, Chinese are sort of, looks like they're taking a step back now. They're not that active the way they were a few months ago. So uh, we are seeing that, uh, we're clearly seeing that uh, China is sort of uh, uh, concerned, concerned about uh, what's going on. And, and the, the, the reverse of that, I mean, the, the other side of the coin is, you're seeing greater Indian influence back in the Sri Lankan economy. Mm. Thank you. I've kind of moved a bit into the future uh, there and we are into our last 10 minutes. So I'm gonna sort of <laughs> hopefully not ask you to speculate too much, but um, let's talk about what, what you guys think might happen next. Um, I have a question from uh, Karen Malmström. Um, and I'm going to sort of roll it into one of mine as well. Um, prior to, I guess, like the last kind of month or so, the last few weeks, we saw like quite a heavy handed response from the Sri Lankan government to the political protests. Uh, you know, we saw a state of emergency, we saw curfews, and we had the night of, uh, of, of violence where at least nine people were killed. And do you, do you think, Amal, that that sort of era is over? Do you think that, you know, with the new prime minister, with this talk of forming committees with youth representatives on, do you think that uh, the sort of, do you think the sort of violent part of this crisis has passed or do you think there's a danger it could erupt again? Well, I think uh, it was a bit of a double-edged sword for the government, uh, Rebecca, having emergency and having curfews because mm. at the same time, they're trying to encourage tourists to visit Sri Lanka. So mm. if you have this uh, emergency, it's difficult to get, uh, you know, encourage people to visit. So the president has uh, quietly allowed the emergency to lapse. So on the 27th of May, that emergency has lapsed, but you still see troops deployed. And that is essentially to uh, support the police in, in maintaining law and order in, in certain places and also for static duties. So I think we have seen the end of that emergency phase. The government's crackdown on uh, on protesters. I don't think that will happen in, in in a sort of in a dramatic way. There would be subtle. There would be some you know subtle moves to uh, uh, disperse protesters. That kind of thing. The um, but we pro we will probably not see uh, any heavy-handed thing in, in in the coming weeks. But of course, this is not to say that we won't have this uh, routine tear gassing and. Uh, uh, water cannon, that kind of thing, because that is something that students, student protesters, I think for them, they, uh, they, they I think, uh, deliberately uh, sort of uh, draw this kind of thing from the police, because they also need to sustain their campaign, and it's been going on for more than 50 days. So we are seeing a, a sort of the, the trend is that fewer people are joining these protests. So the uh, I don't know whether the protests are sort of running out of steam. The people are getting a bit too tired. People are finding it difficult to find uh, fuel to even get to these places. So clearly there is a sort of downward trend when it comes to protests. And uh, I, I think the uh, uh, we won't see much of the uh, violent protests in the coming weeks, but a lot of experts are forecasting food shortages, serious food shortages, for shortages uh, from about August, September or so. Uh, 
So if we get into that stage, then it's going to be uh, you know uh, totally new territory, and I think the all bits are off uh, if we get into that kind of uh, serious food shortages. Thank you, and I uh, have a question that was submitted uh, before uh, before like this morning actually, well before we started. Uh, so I want to get around to it. It's from um, Samanthi Rambuk Potha who says she's lived and worked overseas away from Sri Lanka for nearly 14 years and she lives in uh, Hong Kong now. Um, I think we've already answered your question about what we know about what the government might do economically to reform so I will pass over that but she um, she asks what what plan do you think the government has to communicate what their, their, their reforms what they're trying to do to the people of Sri Lanka and how are they engaging uh, the youth and like industry? Um, so how are they sort of communicating and, and will that communication be successful, do you think? Um, uh, Duthni, would you like to take it first? Uh, yes, I mean, I think communicating with the general public, that's absolutely critical. Um, and, and one of the biggest weaknesses of the uh, previous uh, government that I think they failed to um, be open to, uh, you know, engaging with not just the public, but with the uh, advisors from, you know, outside of the inner circle or with the um, private sector or uh, broader sort of uh, non-governmental um, sector, etc. So here, I think we have a, a situation where um, I mean, I, I, I listened to what Amal said about, you know, the, the public being sort of saying, okay, let's go for IMF. I think that's sort of a, a, a gut reaction to the cues and shortages. And I think there's a perception in, in their minds that, okay, if we do engage with the IMF, you know, the day-to-day -day living conditions are going to ease. And, and, and that's true. But the IMF conditions will also impose a lot of other restrictions. And, and I saw that the public sector has been given a talking to uh, that they should not try and um, uh, sort of, you know, push back against uh, these IMF reforms. And, and, and that's because tied into the IMF will be public sector uh, salary freezers, hiring freezers. So a lot of the preparatory work to show Sri Lanka's commitment to the IMF, like entering into you know, a loving world prices to be market driven, uh, reforming our taxes, etc. Those things have not been done, but we have to, the IMF program is over a three year period. And there are very strict targets that are set over those three period. And the mission comes and checks whether you are adhering to all of it before they release the next um, tranche. So the early sort of, you know, period will be, you know, people are still so uh, preoccupied with um, the economic struggles that they've been having to deal with, um, that they've sort of, you know, uh, not really tuned in to what all of this will mean over the next three years. But when uh, it does start to seep in, I think communicating the need for these reforms and to sustain them is absolutely essential. And Sri Lanka has never done that. That is why we have uh, had 16 IMF programs. And the reason we've had 16 is because we've never completed more than two or three. The moment things start to improve, you know, governments exit from those programs uh, because we have a very sort of a populist approach to uh, at electoral times, they want to give uh, freebies. Uh, and I'm sure that come elections in 2023 or 2024, we're not going to break that cycle. We'll be back again uh, to political parties offering wage increases and all kinds of goodies. Um, and, and that will bring us in, in direct sort of, uh, um, sort of attentions uh, uh, if we have to still continue with an IMF program. So communicating and, and, and educating the people why we have to go through these uh, reforms and to live with them for three years, I think that's essential. We are now only talking about, you know, difficult times for the next two, three months. No, it's going to be difficult times for at least two years. Thank you. Um, we are almost out of time, but I do want to ask this one last question, which again uh, came in, um, and it's, it's uh, directed for you, Amal. Um, 
says uh, Sri Lanka has historically been a dangerous environment for journalists. Um, has this economic crisis opened up new horizons? What risks and taboos are you broaching with your reporting? And have you been able to report on the political aspect of this with relative freedom? Well, I, I think one of the, one of the spin-offs of the crisis is that it has uh, the uh, it has opened up uh, more opportunities for journalists. And uh, uh, what we are seeing also is that uh, there is a very vibrant social media scene in the country. So the uh, if, if you look at the current president, uh, he was never caricatured in the local media uh, during the president the, during Mahindra Rajapaksa's presidency. People were so afraid of uh, this guy. Today he's being lampooned and he's people sort of you know people are shouting at him right outside his uh, office. Uh, people have protested right outside his private home. So the um, that fear is uh, not there anymore. So we are seeing a, a greater a greater degree of uh, freedom, and uh, that has essentially come uh, with with the current crisis. I mean, one, one, if you look at one of the the positive spin-offs of the economic crisis is that uh, people are a, a lot more freer now uh, to criticize uh, the administration, criticize government policies. So this applies to the media as well. So the, I think the media landscape uh, has uh, changed to, to a great extent. And uh, possibly one of the reasons is that today the state considers social media to be their public enemy number one, rather than the mainstream journals. Because I mean, the, the, let's face it that uh, uh, social media tends to be more vocal and more critical and sort of uh, get to the audiences far more quicker uh, than the mainstream media. So the, uh, uh, the authorities generally tend to consider social media to be a, a bigger challenge than the mainstream journalists. So this is, is, is a good thing because the mainstream media has been able to be more critical and, uh, be, uh, and, and offer more uh, balanced uh, analysis of what's going on. So there's greater discussion in, in, in the, even in the local media. Well, thank you both very much. Um, that was that was an unexpectedly positive note to end on, but I'm sure the um, next few months are going to be very hard. Uh, we actually had, if you're interested in um, uh, sending any donations, the Sri Lankan Buddhist Cultural Center in Hong Kong did get in touch and say they are running a campaign. Um, if you're in Hong Kong and you want to um, learn more or help, um, but that's all we have time for now. Um, thank you very much to my guests. Uh, you have really, you really have helped shed light on what's a very complicated and long-running crisis. Um, I, I hope it gets better for you both uh, as well. I'm sure it can't be easy um, over there at the moment. But thank you very much for giving up your time to talk to us uh, this afternoon in Colombo and here in Hong Kong tonight. Um, and to everyone who watched, thank you very much and uh, good night. Thank you, thank Rebecca. You. Thank, thank you for having you us. Bye. Bye. Bye.